Batteries haven't changed in years, but now, here's, uh, they're called solid state batteries. They're very flat and very lightweight. So they want batteries that don't weigh much, carry a lot of charge, and the goal is to come up with what's called the million mile battery. The million mile battery. It's, it's not that you can go a million miles on one charge, but you can use it for a million miles. Keep recharging it and it won't wear out. That means that the battery will outlive the car. Thank you for coming to my book launch. This is the official launch tonight. Uh, before we go any further, I just, oh, thank you. <laughs> So I'd, I'd like you to do something. <clears throat> I'd like you to close your eyes just for a second. Close your eyes, close your eyes. Hello, I'm Bob McDonald. <laughs> now you know who I am, right? That's what you hear on your radio. Now you know what I look like, so. I wrote this book um, because I was getting depressed. I was getting depressed because I've been reporting on the environment for, well, a long time. In fact, my first job at the CBC was to do a documentary for the program Ideas on climate change. And that was in, are you ready? 1977. 1977. And back then there were, there were two thoughts. One was that uh, we're due for another ice age. And the geologists were saying, you know, these warm periods, we've had five ice ages, the warm periods last 10,000 years, and it's been 12,000 years since the last ice age, so we're overdue, it should be getting colder. But then the climatologists were saying, yeah, but we're putting these new things called greenhouse gases into the air. They're going to prevent that. It's going to get warm. So we know who won that debate. And since then, I've been reporting on the environment. And it gets depressing after a while because it's all bad news. We're losing ice in the Arctic. We're losing species. We're losing uh, you know, habitat, droughts, hurricanes, storm, everything. Oh, man, you want to go shoot yourself after a while. So I thought, OK. We've been pointing to the problem for decades, and I'm not minimizing the problem, by the way. It is serious. What are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? So that's what I did here, is to try to put a little bit of hope into the future. And let me start by reading the opening lines to the book, which are also on the back cover. The book starts with, let's start with the good news. The technology to produce energy without carbon emissions already exists. There is, there is as much solar energy beaming down from the sky on the earth every hour that humanity consumes in a year. Energy blows on the wind, boils out of the ground, and literally grows on trees. A new green age is upon us. So that's what I've done. And that's what I want to talk to you tonight about some of the new technology, some of the old technology that's even getting better. Because, let's see if our technology here will work. <laughs> see if this technology works. Because we already know, and I'm sorry for you in the, on the far corner there, the screen is pretty small, but we already know how to capture the energy of the wind. We already know how to capture the energy of the sun, the tides, the waves. What else have I got up there? We know how to store energy in, in, in a number of different forms. Biofuels, we know how to get it from plants if we want. Nuclear energy, we're taking a new look at nuclear energy, and I'll be talking about that. And even fusion energy, replicating the sun here on Earth. We're right on the cusp of doing that. So we've got all of this. So why haven't we been doing it? Why haven't we been moving forward? Well, there are a lot of reasons for that, but we also have a model of how to do it. And it all just happened over the last two years. During COVID, an interesting thing happened. Two things happened during COVID. One, when we were locked down and everybody stayed home, stopped driving cars, and industry shut down, skies cleared. These are maps of carbon emissions over China, over Beijing, and over Shanghai, before and after. The sky's cleared. Here's the northeastern United States, the industrial northeast. The sky's cleared. The carbon emissions went down. And cities that have been polluted for years suddenly had blue skies. Cities in New Delhi, Shanghai, Beijing, France, even Paris, <laughs> all major cities 
had blue skies for the first time in decades because we stopped pumping stuff into it. Isn't that good news? As soon as you stop hurting the atmosphere, it heals itself almost immediately. If we just leave it alone, it'll heal itself. That's really good news that COVID taught us. And the carbon emissions went way down. And not just carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, carbon sulfur dioxide, which comes out of burning coal. They all went down for a couple of months by as much as 35%. That's amazing. So we know how to do that. When we all act together, we know how to drop emissions. The other thing that COVID taught us is how science, the government, industry, and the public can all work together to solve a threat, a threat to humanity. As soon as the COVID virus, this coronavirus, was identified, the Chinese scientists, who were the first to find it in, in Wuhan, China, they did the genome of it. They did the DNA. They sequenced the whole thing. And then they sent that out to the world. And they said, here it is. Here's the virus. And an enormous international effort, including here in Canada, biological labs started to try to study this virus. How does it work? How does it infect you? How do these spikes that stick out of that little ball infect your lungs? Because that's what it does. It goes through the air, it gets into your lungs, and it hijacks your lungs to produce more virus. So just by talking, you start giving off this virus back out into the air, about a meter in front of you, just by talking. You're spreading it. So then science came along and they said, all right, let's uh, change the way we behave. If we're going to come up with a solution to this, the first thing is to try to stop the spread. So let's change our behavior. Let's wear masks to, to prevent it from coming out. Let's wash our hands. Let's stay away from each other. Let's shut down for a while. The government came in and said, this is a mandate. We've got to do that. The government also supported the science and supported the industry to come up with a vaccine, which they did. And they supported the people who had lost their jobs and industries that were suffering. So the government bought into it. Now, there were a few, few protesters. Um, my beautiful partner, <laughs> Jennifer, was in Ottawa at the time. She was living there. She had to put up with the truckers in Ottawa. But they were a minority. They were a small minority of people. Most of us got it. And most of us did it. And what did we do, despite the protests, despite the misinformation about how the virus worked? What did we do? We flattened the curve. Remember when we were told that at the beginning? We were told that. Teresa Tam, our chief medical officer, says, we've got to flatten the curve. It's rising. We've got to flatten. And we did more than once. And we're still doing it now. Wonderful. So there we did it. In two years. And hundreds of billions of dollars were spent fighting COVID. Hundreds of billions of dollars worldwide. It suddenly became available. What a remarkable achievement. A clear and present threat to humanity. Action on the science. Action on industry. Action on the government. Action on the public. We all got together and we beat it. Wow, and here we are. Look, we're sitting in a room now without, without needing masks if you don't want to. It's great. All right, here's another curve that we have to flatten. This is the one I've been talking about, the climate curve. These are the five ice ages that we've had. The low points are the cold, the high points are the warm periods that I was talking about, and you can see that end one doesn't stop. It's still going up. And despite action, despite efforts to try to get this down, for decades we have not flattened this curve. Um, did I do something here? Hey, technology, here we are. Governments get together. We've been getting together at these United Nations conferences. We started with Rio in 92, the Earth Summit. And then we've had Kyoto, we've had Copenhagen, we've had Glasgow, I don't know how many different, 26 of these meetings, 26 of them. And everybody says, yep, we're gonna cut emissions. Then they don't. They get together the, the next one, they say, well, we'll move the goalposts a bit. Just move the goalposts back, we'll meet those. Emissions are still on the rise. That's the bottom line. Sure, there's been some action, but not enough. So the action on the governments is not quite enough. They're, they're aware of it, but they're not moving fast. Now, much to the dismay of Greta Thunberg, <laughs> who's pointing this out, the youth are afraid. The youth are afraid of their own future because they're seeing all this bad news coming out of the environment. Well, let's give them some hope. Let's give them some hope. So there are detractors, just like there were with COVID, 
those who are climate deniers, who put out misinformation or partial information, trying to confuse the public and slow the process down, and they've been very good at that. Here's the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. The elephant in the room, the fossil fuel industry. Now, I'm not calling the fossil fuel industry the enemy, because they're not. And I don't want to get into that mentality. They're the bad guys, and the tree huggers are the good guys. Because as soon as you do that, as soon as you make enemies and you start pointing fingers at who's responsible, whether it's the industry or the government or whoever, everybody just digs in and nothing happens because we all just dig in. What we want is cooperation. Oil is not the problem. It's how we've been burning it that's the problem. Oil is amazing. Oil has so much energy in such a small space. That's why we're using it so much. Now, there's a unit that you can use to describe how much energy is in one barrel of oil, and it's called a joule. And one barrel has <laughs> 6.3 billion joules of energy in it. Now, that's a hard number to get your head around and try to comprehend, but let me show you one. Here's one joule. Pick up something that weighs about a kilo, so that's about a kilogram. Hold it out the side like this and do that. That's one joule. One kilo raised one meter. Okay, that's one joule. So how much is in oil? Well, do this 6.3 billion times, and you've got as much energy in one barrel of oil. That's a lot. That's a lot. Now, even that's hard to get your head around, 6 billion joules. So here's another way, another unit of measurement that somebody actually figured out. The Great Pyramids of Egypt. Somebody calculated how many joules it took to build the pyramids. And all they did was they calculated the mass of all the stones and how high they had to be lifted to make the pyramids. And you come up with a number. And the number that they came up with <laughs> is 2.4 trillion joules to build the pyramids. I'm sure the ancient Egyptians who hauled those stones would say they put out that much in sweat. But 2.3. So how much oil does that represent? How much oil would build the pyramids? It turns out only 400 barrels. 400 barrels could build the pyramids. You can get 400 barrels out of one oil well in one day. One oil well, we'll give you that in one day, you can build the pyramids. That's astounding. That's how much energy is in oil. No wonder we're spoiled. There's what 400 barrels looks like. Each one of those is a 100 barrel, uh, 100 barrel container. So if you look at all the energy that all of humanity burns every year, because here we are, we're just down there burning away everything in sight and eating everything in sight. Our fires are now visible from space. You can see us from space. How much oil or how many pyramids do we burn every year? It turns out we burn two million pyramids of energy every year worldwide. Two million pyramids a year? It took the ancient Egyptians 20 years to do it once. We burn two million a year. That's astounding. Oil has so much energy and we, we're awash in it. We're not even aware of how much we're burning. And this is what we have to either replace or find another way to get the energy out. So we're not going to let this go. This is a golden egg, <laughs> oil, gas, coal. It's, it's so energy dense. And you can store it. You don't have to use it right away, like electricity. You've got to use it as soon as you make it. Oil, you can stick it in a barrel. You can stick coal in a bunker. You can put natural gas in a tank. Use it whenever you want. It's great. You can store it. And it's there anytime you need it. Great. So here's, oh, and, and not only that, we get other things out of oil. Not just gas. We get jet fuel. You get diesel. You get all the cleaning products. A lot of those cleaning products are oil-based. Plastics come from oil. Some of the synthetic fibers that you're wearing right now are oil-based. So it gives us a lot. It's, it gives us a lot. And we'd be putting a lot of people out of business if we instantly went off oil right now. So here's the issue. The issue is how we burn it. We call hydrocarbons hydrocarbons because it's a long chain of carbon atoms with hydrogen stuck to it. And I, I think of it like Christmas tree lights on a string. All the bulbs are the hydrogen. 
And when you, when you light up the string, it's only the bulbs that you care about, right? They're giving you the energy. The string just sits there. When we burn our hydrocarbons, it's the hydrogen that's coming off and combining with oxygen in the air that gives you the energy, the carbon stays behind. And when the carbon loses its hydrogen, it wants to combine with something else. So it says, oh, how about oxygen? Carbon dioxide. Or carbon monoxide, just one. That's poisonous. And if there's sulfur there, it'll, it'll grab oxygen out of the air, make sulfur dioxide, which gets in the atmosphere, mixes with water, and gives you sulfuric acid, acid rain. So it's the leftovers. That's the problem. So what if? What if, and the oil companies are now looking at this, what if we just took the hydrogen out and just burn that? Because when you burn hydrogen, you get hydrogen and oxygen, you put them together, it's called dihydrous monoxide. H2O. Mmm. Dihydrous monoxide, that's what water is. Uh, so that's all you get, it's clean, you get water. So let's just do that. And there's actually, the oil companies are now looking at just getting hydrogen out of oil, and we can do that. Um, there's a car that Toyota already makes called the Mira that runs on hydrogen, it's a fuel cell. And there are experimental hydrogen fueling stations. I live on the West Coast now, I'm in Victoria, uh, British Columbia. Victoria, we have one there. There's uh, several of them in Vancouver, and they're also in California. And these are prototypes, to, and, and you fill it up just like a regular car. You don't have to charge it for eight hours like a battery. You can fill it up in a couple of minutes, run on hydrogen. Now, there's a company in Saskatchewan that has figured out a way to get the hydrogen out of the oil while it's still in the ground. While it's still in the ground. They have two oil wells, and they're using abandoned oil wells to do this. They put water and steam down one. It reacts with the oil. The oil gives off hydrogen. Hydrogen comes up the other. So we just get the hydrogen, leave the oil in the ground. This is just one scenario that can keep the oil industry in business. They're still energy companies. They're just giving us a different product. And I'd like to put a challenge out to all the young scientists in our universities right now to come up with another way to get energy out of oil. I'm sure it's there without the emissions. Or let's capture those emissions, carbon capture, and stuff them underground. So there are ways to keep oil going without the emissions. We just need to look at that. Now, I know, uh, oh, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm jumping around. Iceland, the country of Iceland, it's a volcano, the whole country. So their energy comes from geothermal. And they use some of that geothermal energy for their electricity, and they're working on a hydrogen economy because Iceland doesn't have any oil of its own. They have to import everything, so it's very expensive for them. So what they're doing is they're taking their cheap electricity that's clean because it's geothermal and they're breaking down water to make hydrogen. And then they're going to have a hydrogen economy. Remember that high school experiment where you took a thing of water and you put two electrodes in it, put it on a battery and it bubbled? One's hydrogen, one's oxygen. That's what they do. It's called electrolysis. So Iceland is doing that with their free energy. By the way, they also do district heating. They take the heat of the ground and they pump it into buildings. So a lot of homes in Iceland don't have furnaces. They're heated by the earth. And they also heat up greenhouses. Iceland is one of the major producers of fruit and vegetables in that part of the world, yet it's above the Arctic Circle because they're harnessing the heat of the earth. Now in Canada, geothermal is a little trickier because you need volcanic areas to do that, and most of them are in the west, in the mountains. Most of the industry is over here in the east, and it's hard to transport heat. But locally, you could have it out there in the west. And that's the thing about alternative energy. It's not one solution for everyone. Some areas are going to be good for solar, some are going to be good for wind, some are good for geothermal, etc. But that's very smart of what Iceland is doing right now. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Oh, <laughs> Airbus. The airline industry uh, contributes a lot to carbon emissions. They know that. They're going to hydrogen. Uh, Airbus is producing a hydrogen airplane that runs both on hydrogen and electricity. It's a hybrid engine. So they have a commuter plane that's like our Dash 8 that we have here in Canada. They have a small jet that they're going to convert to hydrogen. And they have a very futuristic looking called the blended wing. Now think about hydrogen. It gives you lots of energy, but it, it takes up more space. It's, it's, it's a less dense gas. So that means that the fuel tanks 
which are normally in the wings of an airplane. They, they'll still be in the wings, but there will also have to be a, a tank in the back where you're sitting. <laughs> so you'll be sitting with a tank of hydrogen in your airplane. How do you feel about that? <laughs> I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> what about the Hindenburg? Oh, man, it's going to blow up like the Hindenburg. It's too bad this was caught on film. <laughs> because there were other airship crashes. This wasn't the only one. But let me tell you something about the Hindenburg disaster. 94 people survived that. More than half of the passengers survived it. And the reason they survived is because the hydrogen that was in the big envelope at the top that gave it the lift, when it burned, it went up. You can see it here. It went up, because hydrogen is lighter than air. You get a leak of hydrogen, it rises. So the hydrogen fire was over in 45 seconds. That's how long it took the hydrogen to burn. So it went up. Everybody was in the gondola underneath the fire. And as the gondola sank to the ground, they just jumped out windows and they ran away from underneath it. So the fire was above their heads. The people that died in the Hindenburg were not killed by the hydrogen fire. They were killed by the collapsing structure and the diesel fuel from the engines because diesel fuel, like gasoline, when you get a leak, it goes down. It stays on the ground. That's why when there's a car accident on, on a highway that's a serious collision, the fire department always shows up. Because if there's a leak of gas, it goes underneath the car and it'll barbecue the car because it burns from the bottom up. If you have a hydrogen car, you get a leak, the hydrogen goes up. So in many ways, hydrogen is safer than gasoline. But we have this perception because of the, uh, of the Hindenburg. And this is what I'm finding is one of the, the barriers to going to alternative energy, no matter what it is, is fear. Fear. We're afraid of new things. We're afraid of change. We're afraid of things that might have happened in the past. And that's stopping us. And we've got to get over the fear of change because these things, these things can really help us out. All right. So much for hydrogen. Um, electric cars. You're probably noticing more electric cars on the road now than there ever were. And they're coming in. All the manufacturers are building electric cars. So the cost is going to come down. You don't have to pay $150,000 for a Tesla unless you can afford that. But all the, the, the price is going to come down. And I thought it was very brave of Ford to take their iconic gas-guzzling muscle car, the Mustang, and they made an electric version of it. That's great. Of course, you can still get the muscle car. <laughs> but they made an electric car out of it. And all the manufacturers and universities, including here in Canada, are working on better batteries, because the battery is the big hang-up. Batteries haven't changed in years, but now, here's, uh, they're called solid-state batteries. They're very flat and very lightweight. So they want batteries that don't weigh much, carry a lot of charge, and the goal is to come up with what's called the million-mile battery. The million-mile battery. It's, it's not that you can go a million miles on one charge, but you can use it for a million miles. Keep recharging it, and it won't wear out. That means that the battery will outlive the car. Because most cars die around, what, 250,000? So. so when a car dies, and you send it back for recycling or whatever, you take the battery out, you put the battery in another new car. So the same battery can run four or five cars. So now you're not making as many batteries, because you're, you're putting them in more cars. They're also looking at different materials, because lithium, has to be mined, and there are some issues with that. Uh, cobalt comes from the Congo in, in Africa. They have labor issues with child labor there. So people are looking at other materials. Do you, do you know that there's a battery, their experimental battery? It's made of iron, and all it does is rust. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> it rusts, and it gives you electricity. How neat. They're working on aluminum batteries, sulfur, all kinds of different things. So battery technology is coming along. So we're going to electrify cars. Um, we know how to capture solar panels. We've had those around for a very, very long time, both on rooftops. If you own a house, look into it. Just do some research. Because there's a, a myth out there that is super, super expensive. And it might seem expensive at the front end, but do some research. It has come down in cost a lot. And find out how long it takes before you get your money back in what you're saving with fuel. Because fuel prices are going up, and they're not going to come down. So just, just do some research. It may not be for you. You may not live in the right area. 
Maybe there's tall trees on the south side of your house. I don't know. But just look into it. But in addition to those that we see on rooftops and those that we see out in fields covering up a whole lot of land and people say, oh, that land could be used for agriculture, you know. What are we doing covering it with solar panels? Yeah, they have a point. Although most of them are in deserts. But that is a point. Well, there's another kind of solar material. It's a crystal called perovskite. And these perovskites, there's a whole family of them, they can be printed into really thin films, so thin that you can actually see through them, but they still conduct electricity. So that means that you could have perovskite-coated windows. And if you think about all the windows that we have, now I, I lived for 40 years here in Toronto. I moved away 11 years ago. And every time I come back, I can't believe how many more condos there are here. Like every time there's another 10 of them along the lakeshore or something. All of those glass windows facing south. What a huge area, surface area, that could be coated with solar materials. And here's another idea. It's just a concept at this point. Perovskites could be incorporated into paint. So just paint your house. <laughs> paint your house and it'll become solar. How neat. Also, if you had paint on the inside, like suppose this room had perovskite paint. It would look just like normal paint. You wouldn't even know it's there. But when you turn on the lights like this, some of the light would go into the paint and it would be turned back into electricity. Recycling light. Recycling light. What a great idea. I love that. So solar energy is going to be everywhere. You won't even know it. It'll be incorporated into buildings and it'll be there. It won't just have to be these big farms like we're seeing now. So solar, watch solar. It's, it's really changing and it's evolving. Um, in addition to putting them in fields, some countries like in India and in California, they're covering canals because canals cover a huge area. They're just long and they're putting the solar panels over that to prevent evaporation because the panels prevent the sun. And solar panels actually work better when they're a little cooler. And it also prevents algae from growing in the water. And California right now is really worried about water. So putting solar panels over top of them would actually help with uh, the evaporation. So there's a lot happening in solar. Wind. Uh, we've been capturing the wind for centuries. I'm a sailor. And I have some personal stories in here as well uh, to liven up the chapters. I have a chapter I started out with uh, getting caught in a storm off Florida. Not the kind that just went through there. <laughs> but I did have a boat in Florida for a while. I'm really glad it's not there now. But uh, I got, I've been punched by storms, and you can have too much sail up, and you just get, it's like an invisible hand comes along and pushes your sails into the sea. And the boat goes right over under his side, and you're terrified what's going to happen here. The power of the wind is amazing. And we've been capturing this for so long, sailing up and down the Nile, sailing across oceans. Holland was built on wind power, pumping the water out of their polders. And here in North America, when rural areas were settled before electricity made it to rural areas, these ubiquitous windmills were both pumping water and they had small turbines on them that were generating electricity to keep the house lights on at night. So these things were, were ubiquitous. Now we have these three-bladed propeller style. They turn out to be the most efficient and the best design. And you've probably seen a lot of them around. I know if you go to Kingston, they're out on Wolf Island, there's a whole field of them. And people complain, they're ugly. They're ugly. Well, I think a coal-fired new <laughs> generating station is ugly. But people are worried about there's so many of them. And again, they're covering farmland, although you can farm under a, a, a wind power. Well, these are changing too. They've gone big, very big. Size matters in wind energy. The more area you cover, the more wind you catch, the more energy you can generate. So they're getting very, very large, almost as tall as the Eiffel Tower. Here's a scale model, that little picture on the, uh, on the left there. That's the Peace Tower in Ottawa on our parliament buildings to scale. These windmills are two and a half times taller than the Peace Tower, almost as high as the Eiffel Tower. And they put out so much energy, 15 megawatts, a single turn of the blade can generate enough electricity to power a house for two days. Just one rotation of the blade. And the thing by itself, one turbine can power about 15 or 16,000 homes. So we no longer need huge fields of the smaller ones. You just put a few of these big ones. And instead of putting them on land, the idea is to put them out at sea so that they're out where the wind is more, more consistent anyway. And they're either on 
on uh, platforms, or they can even float. They have floating ones if the water's deep. So along the east coast and west coast of our country, we could have wind power out there capturing the energy of the wind, and that's the future. Uh, the United States is already going to do it off the east coast in the Atlantic. They have a project there. Canada, we haven't bought into it as much yet, but we could. The prairies, no shortage of wind on the prairies. No shortage of wind in the Arctic, although you have to heat them because they'll, they'll ice up. But wind is a tremendous, tremendous energy source. Um, wind turbines can also be adapted to go underwater. Scotland is uh, putting a lot of energy into tidal energy, a lot of effort into tidal energy. Again, I live on the west coast, and we have what are called the Gulf Islands. They're between Vancouver Island and the mainland. And the tide flows through there. And when tide goes between islands, it speeds up. And you get these currents that are very, very strong. I, when I first moved out there, I was on my sailboat. And I had the sails up, beautiful day, going along. I thought, well, that's very nice. Then I looked at the shoreline, and I was going backwards. <laughs> because the tide was stronger than the wind. <laughs> so I was sailing back. I was under total control. But I guess, well, I guess we're going this way, not where I was planning. So the tidal currents are quite strong. Scotland has the Orkney Islands at the top. So they're putting underwater turbines to capture that tide. And we know exactly when the tides are going to be flowing, four times a day, and we can predict that for the next 500 years. It's so precise. So we know when it's going to be there. Um, there's another approach, though. Some people say, well, what about fish? You know, are these fish choppers? <laughs> it turns out that where the tide flows really quickly, fish don't tend to hang out. They like to be in more calm water. So there aren't as many fish in these areas, but it is an issue. So they're thinking about floating tidal generators. They look like boats, and they have big propellers, but the propellers don't drive the boat. They anchor the boat, and the propellers stick down into the water, and as the tide goes by, the propellers are spun by the tide, and they generate electricity. So this is one in Nova Scotia. They're testing this right now in the Bay of Fundy. And in Scotland, they have one that looks like something Batman would drive. It's a, it's a really long, sort of, looks like a submarine with these two big wings out the side and huge propellers. Now, the advantage of these is that they'll, they'll generate electricity, but if you need to work on them, you just raise them up out of the water. Whereas the ones that are sitting on the bottom, you've got to haul them up if you need to work on them. So this is, this is the future. These can be anywhere in the world. So tidal energy, not good for Toronto, <laughs> but great for Nova Scotia, great for British Columbia. Um, where else am I going? There's always the question of what do you do when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine? And that's a problem, because your energy is variable. So that means you have to store it somewhere. And the most common way right now is in batteries. And there are these gigantic battery packs that can run, well, run a small town for about five hours on batteries. But they're very expensive. But there are other ways of storing energy. Other ways of storing energy besides in batteries. Um, we could put it into hydrogen like I was talking about before. Have your windmills generate hydrogen, then use that when you need it to generate electricity, you burn it. Or there's a company right here in Ontario that's using compressed air. So what they have is a mine, an abandoned mine underground, and they just sealed it up a little bit, and they pump air into this thing. And they just keep pumping it up and pumping it up until the pressure goes way, way up. So it's like a balloon that you blow up and it's, it's, it's under pressure. When you need that energy, you let the air come out, like when you let a balloon off, you know, and as the air comes up, it spins a turbine and generates electricity. Air, air, it's clean. It's clean and it's easy to store. So there's another way you can store energy. And are you all familiar with the myth of Sisyphus? Sisyphus, terrible, terrible fate. Uh, he insulted the gods. He's one of the, uh, the ancient Greek, uh, Greek mythology. He insulted the gods, and they punished him by having him roll a rock up a hill every day. And it took tremendous energy for him to roll the rock up to the hill, and as soon as it got to the top, it rolled back down again. And he had to do it again for the rest of his life, rest of eternity, keep rolling it up. Well, Sisyphus didn't know it, but he was the world's first mechanical battery. He was the first mechanical battery because that stone, when he put it up at the top of the hill, it gained energy. It gained potential energy, which is the potential to fall. That's what drives a roller coaster. Roller coasters don't have motors. They're pulled up a hill by a chain, and then gravity runs it for the rest of the track. 
So when the rock comes down, it's releasing its energy. And that energy, if that rock hits something, there's a lot of energy there, the energy of motion. So mechanical batteries. And there's actually a group in Europe that's building something that Sisyphus would be proud of. It's a big stack of huge concrete blocks. And when the, when the electricity's cheap, they stack these things up in a big pile, and there's a bunch of cranes at the top. And when they need the energy, they pick up one of these blocks, they hold it out over the side, and they just let it slowly fall. And as it's going down, there's a pulley at the top of the crane, and it's spinning around, and it's generating electricity on gravity. So gravity is storing energy. Again, totally clean. Remember the old grandfather clocks? I see some, some people here dye their hair gray like I do. So you remember the, the tall, thin clocks with the tick-tock? They ran on gravity. They ran on gravity. You had to wind them up, but what you were winding were weights on the inside that rose up, and the weights would slowly fall and, and make the mechanism go. So it was gravity. They were operated by gravity. So this is the same thing for storing energy. So there are lots of ways to store energy. Here's one more. Uh, this is a group in Norway, <clears throat> and they're storing energy in these big tanks. The tanks are filled with <laughs> sand. Sand. Now, I'm sure you've been on a tropical beach when the sun's shining, and you forget to put your shoes on, and you walk out on the sand. Hot, 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 hot. You realize how hot sand can get? You can heat sand up to 1,000 degrees Celsius, and it will not melt. 1,000 degrees. Here's that same container in infrared light. It's incredibly hot, and it'll store it. And not only are they storing heat in the sand in these containers, they dig these big underground pits, put piping in them, and fill it with sand. And they're getting seasonal heat. Seasonal. The heat lasts for months. And that's how they're doing district heating in Norway now, because they have dark winters like we do. So they're heating their homes with sand. So we don't have to always think about storing energy in the form of electricity. There's lots of ways to store it. Energy comes in many, many different forms. Nuclear. Now this is always a trigger. Every time I mention the word nuclear, there's a lot of reaction to that. Ooh. Think about Chernobyl. Think about Three Mile Island. Think about Fukushima. Nuclear is bad. Even though in Ontario, we're almost entirely nuclear powered with Darlington and Pickering and Bruce. Nuclear energy actually has the best safety record of all energy sources. How many oil wells have blown up and spilled their oil? How many, uh, you know, like in the Gulf? How many ships have run aground? How many trains have derailed? We, we put up with that. Nuclear actually has the safest industry. And let me tell you something about Three Mile Island. Nobody died. Nobody died in Three Mile Island. And in fact, the meltdown, and it did melt down, but the reactor did exactly what it was supposed to do. It contained the meltdown. It was a human error that, that drained the water out of the reactor. They're cooled by water. The water drained out, and it melted, but it was contained. Unfortunately, <laughs> three days before the reactor melted down, a movie called The China Syndrome came out. And the movie was about a meltdown. And they were saying, Man, if that stuff gets out, it's going to melt right through the container, right through the earth, all the way to China. It doesn't. <laughs> they contained it. And even in Chernobyl, they've, they've still got the, the fuel in the reactors. It didn't go through the earth. And the same thing in Fukushima. Nobody died in Fukushima from the nuclear meltdown. There were three reactors that melted down. People died from the tsunami. People died in a panic to get out of the area, but nobody's died from the nuclear reactor. They, they show footage of the buildings exploding. That wasn't a nuclear explosion. That was hydrogen, because the water got so hot, it broke down into hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen accumulated at the top of the building. That's what blew up, not the reactors. That fuel is still there. But there's a new method. There's a new way to look at nuclear power. They're called small modular reactors. Instead of these giants that we have now that cost billions of dollars and take years to build and, and huge amounts of money to run, the reactor itself is very small. Some of them are, are not much bigger than this podium that I'm standing at. And they don't put out a whole lot of power, but they're enough to run one town. They can fit on the back of a truck, and they're completely sealed up. They're made in a factory. They're totally sealed up. You don't touch them at all. And then you put them underground. You bury them. And you just get the energy out of it. 
Just get the energy out of it, make your electricity. It'll sit there for 30 years. And then 30 years later, you pull it out, you put in a new one, and you send it back to the factory. Nobody touches it. And they're using a different principle, a different kind of fuel than what we're using now. The fuel cannot melt because it's a liquid in some of them. It's already a liquid, so it can't melt. Others are called pebble bed. They're like baseballs inside. And if something goes wrong, they just drop down and the reaction stops. So they're very, very self-contained. They're not, nothing is 100%. You, know, you can never say something's 100% safe, but they're very different. One of these could power our towns in the Arctic right now that we have in the north of Canada. They're all running on diesel generators. And they spend thousands, <laughs> thousands of liters of diesel every year to keep these things and they're spewing carbon into the, into the air. One of these could power a town. And if you need more power, just add another one. You can make, because they're modular, right? You can add them. So this is the future of nuclear, and Canada is investing in this. We're looking into it a lot. They're building a prototype in New Brunswick right now. So we're going to rethink nuclear. But what we need to do before we go ahead with this is have very frank, open discussions between the industry. The nuclear industry has been very bad at communicating how this stuff works. They've got to get better at that. And by the way, these types of reactors, they've been in aircraft carriers, nuclear-powered submarines, Russian icebreakers for decades with no incidents. So we know how to build small reactors. We know how to do that. So let's rethink nuclear and have an intelligent conversation about that. Because nuclear, no emissions, and it's there 24-7. It's always there. It's your baseline. And that, that's the kind of thing that we need. So we're going to rethink that. Fusion power. There's a joke. <laughs> There's a joke with fusion. Fusion has been 20 years away for 50 years. So fusion is different from nuclear fission that we're doing now. Instead of breaking big atoms of uranium apart, split the atom to get energy, you're fusing them together. You're taking atoms and you're forcing them to fuse, which is what the sun does. Atoms don't like to do that. They don't like to fuse. There are forces that are pushing them apart, so you really need to hit them hard. Now, the sun's big enough, it can do that. We're not the size of the sun. So in order to do it, to create one of these plasmas, <laughs> they have one little tiny obstacle they have to overcome. They need to reach a temperature of, <laughs> get ready, 150 million degrees. That's 10 times hotter than the center of the sun. So they got to do that. What kind of a container can you put something that hot in? It'll melt the container. So in order to get it to work, they have to create these donuts. They're called a torus. It's a, it's a donut-shaped room. And you use really powerful magnets to suspend the plasma midair so it doesn't touch the walls. But it takes so much energy to do that. At the moment, they're putting more in than they're getting out. So they're waiting for a break-even point. They're very, very close. There's a, a pilot project in France right now that's almost nearing completion, and they're expecting to get 10 times out what they put in. And once it starts, it's self-sufficient. It'll run itself. So you take some of the energy and put it back into running it. No emissions. We don't get the nuclear waste like we do with the kind that we have right now. So we'll see what's happening with fusion. Hopefully it's not another 50 years away. Um, and then some crazy ideas. I have a chapter called Great Idea, but ideas that didn't quite make it. And one of them it could be done. It's called solar-based uh, power. So you put up a gigantic satellite in space with mirrors on it. It captures sunlight, converts it into a microwave or a laser beam, and beams it to the ground. And then on the ground, you have a big receiving station that receives that and converts it into electricity. One of these could power all of Toronto, Hamilton, and Niagara Falls, the Golden Horseshoe. One satellite could do that. But how would you feel having a laser beam coming down from space? <laughs> uh, I don't know, but anyway, it could be done. But nobody wants to put the money out to do this just yet. So that's one of the crazy ideas. Besides the technology itself, um, there are other ways. There's, there's what, what I call the invisible power plant. And this is efficiency. So we can cut down on how much we're wasting, because we waste a lot. And we make houses that are little tiny boxes facing in all kinds of different directions. But a lot could be done to make homes more efficient, besides just insulating them well and putting solar panels on the roof. You can, this, this is a, a picture of Vancouver in infrared. All the hot spots are houses, they're roofs. All the purple spots are trees. 
So one thing we do is just plant more trees downtown because they absorb heat and uh, they cool the city. So because cities have bubbles over them, heat bubbles, largely caused by rooftops that are black. So they're, they're absorbing sun in the summertime and then giving all that heat off. Well, if you change just the shape of a house, just its shape, you make it out of the same materials, but put all the windows on the south side facing the sun, and you give it a thick concrete floor that'll absorb that sunlight and store the heat, heat your water, you run pipes through it to heat your water, and have creative ventilation, you don't need a furnace. And I've been in houses like this, it's called passive solar. So the sun comes in, even in the winter time, and it'll heat up the house, and you create a natural circulation by opening vents at the top and the bottom. And the air will naturally circulate around and heat your house, passive solar. And it doesn't have to look extreme like this one. Here's a passive solar house that looks like a regular house. But it's just designed so that it'll capture the sun. We can do that. We can be more efficient and just change the look of our neighborhoods. Um, we can also change the look of our cities. And I notice this is happening here in Toronto, much to the chagrin of taxi drivers, <laughs> but there are more bike lanes, and this is great. Our cities were designed with the car in mind, with really wide boulevards, and people drive fast on wide boulevards. So you narrow the boulevard. People drive slow when there's only one lane in each direction, and you put patios outside. We, get, we did this during COVID. When restaurants were closed down, they were allowed to put patios out on the sidewalk. Keep that. Make them pedestrian friendly. Make cities more pedestrian friendly. More light rail and more efficient, fast transport so that it's walkable, have the walkable city. And we can do that as well. And a lot of cities are already doing this. Um, Toronto can go a lot farther than it has, but it's making the city a place that people want to be. And you have a village lifestyle so you can walk to all the things you need from your home. You don't have to get in a car and, and drive to, uh, to, to the suburbs. I'll just leave you with um, a thought. I meet some really interesting people in my work. It's a privilege to do what I do. I, I like to say I talk to smart people for a living. That's what I do. Sometimes I feel sorry for my colleagues who are the political reporters, but... Uh, <laughs> oops, sorry. Are there any politicians? <laughs> no, I, 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 I talk to really smart people. And this, uh, this guy in the white t-shirt, I, I met him at a conference that I helped organize here in Toronto, and I was sitting beside him at dinner, and I said, would you like to go sailing tomorrow? Because I had a boat here in Toronto as well. And he said, sure. I went, wow, this is great. Because when I was a kid, I watched Buzz Aldrin walk on the moon. He landed with Neil Armstrong on the very first landing. I took Buzz Aldrin sailing. How about that? How cool is that? Yeah. I've met several people who have walked on the moon. There was only 12 of them that walked on the moon, and a lot of them have died off. Buzz is still around. He's in his 90s, but he's still around. And uh, he said something very interesting. He's, he's one of only... 24 humans who saw the Earth like this, who went to the moon. They don't see this today. When you go up into space today on the space station, it's only 400 kilometers up, which isn't very high. They can see the curve of the Earth, but they can't see the whole planet. They're too close. That's like here to Ottawa, the distance that they're up. It's not that far. So you got to go to the moon before you can see the whole Earth. And Buzz said, you know, the moon is a really interesting place but it's not a very nice place. And he's right. It'll kill you. The moon will kill you. The sky there is black because there's no air. So you, you can't survive on the moon without a spacesuit, without bringing part of the Earth with you. And they also saw this Earth as one living unit in a very black, violent universe. And we've been searching for other Earths, and we haven't found one yet. We're up to 5,000. We've now found 5,000 planets going around other stars in our galaxy. That's astounding. But none of them are like that. None of them. They're either too hot or they're too cold or they're too different. We haven't found another Earth yet. We will. But when we do, it's going to be very, very far away from here. We can't get to it. We can't get to it. And even the planets in our solar system, people want to go to Mars. Yep, they'll do that. But Mars has no oxygen in its atmosphere. It's all carbon dioxide. So you gotta wear a spacesuit the whole time. You go for a walk on Mars, you gotta wear a spacesuit. Just like Canada in the wintertime, you gotta put on a coat before you go outside. It'll kill you. Canada will kill you in the wintertime <laughs> if you don't wear the right equipment. So this is it. This, this is 
in. Here we are at night. This, the, blue mar the other one was called the blue marble. This is the black marble. It's a, a collection of satellite photos that were made of the Earth at night. So there we are. And again, our fires are visible from space. And this light that you see shining up, this is the other side, that's Asia and India. This light that you see shining up is light we don't use. We, use, we put lights on the ceiling so we can see where we're going. Any light that shines upwards is light we're throwing away. And that's what we do, we throw away. We throw away light, we throw away heat, we throw away food, we throw away water, we throw away a lot. So we can solve this, we can do it. We have to because this is it, this is it. We live in the Garden of Eden, as far as planets go. We live in the Garden of Eden. As much as I like Star Trek, one of the things that bugs me is that every time they go to another planet and they beam down to the surface, it's always a really nice day. <laughs> they don't even wear sweaters, for God's sakes. It's always warm and sunny and nice. It's not like that. The universe is a deadly, violent, violent place, and we live in this amazing oasis. This is it. So if we're going to move ahead with green technology, like we did with COVID, it's going to take some science. The science is already there. It's going to take some solutions. The solutions are already there. It's going to take some government support. There's a little government support, but we can do more. And it's going to take industry to invest in it. Do you know that the green sector is one of the fastest growing sectors of the economy? It's a good investment. And if you adopt green technology, like put solar panels on your house or whatever, you're saving money in the long run because fuel prices are still going up. The cost of solar is coming down. So do the math. And then we, the public, have to buy into it as well and, and get past the fear and get past the misinformation and move ahead. I'm optimistic. In all this bad news about the environment, I'm actually optimistic. I think we're clever. We're smart, especially here in Canada. We've got so much intellectual capital. We've been to the moon, for God's sakes. We solved COVID. We've done so many other things. We can do this. So I hope you enjoy the book. And thank you so much for coming for my launch tonight. This really meant a lot. Thank you.